This is a quick take produced by American Bankruptcy Institute. And today we are coming to you from ABI's annual spring meeting in Washington, DC. I am Bill Rochelle, ABI's editor at large. For the next few minutes, we're going to be talking with Holly Etlin, managing director at Alex Partners in New York City, or at least that's where she's based. Because I know that in your business, you're never at home. It's true, Bill. Well, listen, uh, you're doing a panel here at the spring meeting that is fascinating. It's basically how to restructure, reorganize a company that doesn't have a business anymore. I mean, such as retailing newspapers where the top line, the revenue, is just going south in a big way. Um, and I have come to know over the years that retailing is sort of your sweet spot. So I'm guessing you're kind, you're kind of busy right now, huh? Yes, very much. Well, how is it, or what do you do in approaching a company like a retailer where the problem is not cutting expenses, but sales? You know, the sales line in any business that's undergoing structural change, Bill, is the hardest thing to fix. You know, management is really good at addressing cost reductions and uh, not so good at figuring out whether there is a bottom to the sales curve and the sales decline. So in retail, you really have to assess, is it a product issue, is it a customer issue, or is it a location issue, and really very quickly figure out whether structurally there's a way to stabilize that top line or not, or whether there's a new sort of lower dynamic you can restructure the company to. Now, if you look at the typical retailer today, what they're doing is very actively culling stores, getting rid of lower performing stores, and trying to make sure that they preserve the capital for expansion of any online presence that they have. And you see that both in healthy retailers and distressed retailers. I mean, the, the numbers of store closures in 2017 were astonishing, although they've been predicted for many years. We've been talking about right. the right. U.S. having one-third too many stores, right. physical stores, for 10 years or more now. And we didn't see that fallout during the financial crisis, and, but now we are. Well, you know, that's an interesting question because people have been saying for as long as I can remember that we've got maybe twice as many square feet per person of retail space in this country than, say, for instance, in Europe. Why it's actually six times. Six? You're kidding six me. Six times as compared to Europe. You're kidding me. Double as compared to Canada and Australia. Oh, my goodness. Well, how did we get away with it for so long? You know, I, I think we have a different um, economy, consumer-based economy in the United States than in Europe. Um, you know, and everybody, there was so much pressure, I think, from the investors in retail um, to, for retailers to continue to show expansion um, and to really continue to grow. And there are only two ways you grow. You either grow same store sales, i.e. sales, comp sales, year over year an existing store base, yep. or you grow by adding stores. And retail needs to always, to have a healthy retail chain, you need to be opening about 5% new stores every year, but you also need to be closing about 5%. You and know, we got into that ditch of not closing underperforming locations. You know, I remember. Back when I was a kid lawyer, I represented a convenience store chain, very prominent, I won't mention the name, but it was family owned at the time. And they told me that the key to their business, which at the time was extremely successful, was that for every two stores they opened, they closed one. Then later, the company was LBO'd. They stopped that practice, it went down the toilet. Mm -hmm. So I guess there is something to getting out of the stores uh, as soon as you can. By the way, uh, I'm curious, with what's going on in retail, 
are store owners able to go to landlords and handle deals for concessions on rent or are the landlords just saying tough nuggies, pay up? The dynamic between retailers and their landlords has changed pretty dramatically over the past two years and people are getting lots of concessions. And that of course then causes you to think about, well, if I can get enough concessions and maybe then the cash flow in the store is pretty good, I should maybe keep the store in that location. The problem is so many of these malls are just not going to be the future of where you want to have your store. And so is it better to make a decision to keep a store in place because you've gotten rent concessions and so at least today it's cash flowing for you? Or is it better to say, you know what, it's really still not meeting the hurdle rate for the inventory and the time and energy that we invest in this particular mm -hmm. location, shouldn't we redeploy that capital somewhere else? But when you're highly levered, as most retailers are right now, and cash, cash flow is the most important thing, the pressure is immense to keep every bit of cash flow you can possibly figure out how to have rather than taking the big step to restructure the business so that your actual return on capital invested is much higher. You know, speaking of capital, all businesses need capital. What's the market like today in retailing in terms of the capacity to attract new capital, new capital investment? Uh, it's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, retail is retail is definitively radioactive right now. <laughs> radioactive. And so, you know, and I'll and I'll contrast a couple of recent cases that I was personally involved in. You know, in BCBG, Max Ezria, last year I was CRO, we took it through a restructuring. The um, money that we needed to really take the company through a restructuring was very, very generously um, put in by their owner. Guggenheim, um, who really bridged us to a sale and allowed us to fix the business. They, they put up an additional $85 million dip um, behind the existing bank group and really facilitated giving us the time to fix the company and get it to a successful sale. And now the company's owned by GBG and beat its first year estimates on the business plan, is knocking it out of the park, and that's fabulous. But we didn't have that bridge, which came from a party already in the case, we wouldn't have gotten there because nobody else wanted to do it. So now let's contrast that with bond time, which is the sad story of the week. Right. Um, we had a great turnaround plan in place that really was accomplishable and achievable, but we needed to find somebody to put capital into the business to finance a restructuring. And every private equity player we approached, with the exception of a couple, when they went to their boards or their investment committees, nobody wanted to go double down in retail, and particularly not retail that was a regional department store chain. Mm. And that was a really difficult situation in that we just couldn't get anybody interested because it was retail. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, uh, you know, I'm glad I have a secure job with AVI and don't have to be running a retailer this year or even advising them on the, uh, the legal side. Uh, how long do you think it's going to be in retailing before the market turns and you've hit the bottom and then there is some improvement? You know, I think we're about a year and a half into a three to five year cycle of really vetting out retail. You know, we've had some really successful reorganizations this past year. Um, Jimboree, Route 21, Payless, they all went in and came back out, restructured and with new ownership. Um, now we're seeing a greater mix of liquidations. Obviously, you know, we've had Sports Authority and other things, uh, Toys R Us, which didn't make it. Um, so, you know, I suspect based upon what we see for go, looking forward, we're in about a, a, you know, a year, two years into a three to five year cycle. By the way, let me ask you one last question. Congress changed the law on retailers and now essentially forces them to make quick decisions 
on either assuming or rejecting real estate leases. If that were to disappear and retailers did not have to so quickly decide about giving up stores, do you think that would change or improve the capacity of retailers to reorganize, or does it not matter? It matters greatly. It matters greatly. I've, I have been in practice you know, at a senior level working with retailers before the 2005 bankruptcy yeah. amendments and after, and it, it hugely impacts what you can do. It, you know, it used to be that every retailer, they wanted them to go through a holiday season and a proof yes. point right. to show that you really had your act together and that you, know, you had an opportunity to see a business get fixed and operate for a period of time before then you address the balance sheet. And you could operate inside Chapter 11, like when I did Winn-Dixie, for example. You know, we were in bankruptcy for 18 months, and that company came out very successful at the far side now. Of course, since then, it was acquired by Bilo. Yep. They let all the good management go. They kept all the bad management, and, you know, here we yep. go. Yep. Um, but um, it definitely would. Uh, you know, the, there's only one mitigating factor to that, and that is the rise of the second lien, third lien, fourth lien lending that's go on, gone on in the retail space that takes away the typical liquidity opportunity that you would get from going and getting a dip loan. You know, in the yeah. past for retail, you had some dry powder effectively yeah. when you filed that you could get that additional liquidity to bridge yourself. It's much more difficult now because of these very, very levered capital structures, ever more levered. You know, you've got your ABL lenders who lend to liquidation value, which is very accepted. But then you've layered now a lien holders behind them, and you just don't have room to maneuver. Left. That's right. Well, listen, I said it was, that was my last question, but something you said made me think of another one. The 2005 amendments with respect to executory leases was intended to help retailers because they thought that if they could get the stores back, they could more often than not be able to relet the space at a better price. So it would be beneficial for them. Help the landlords, yes. Uh, did I say it backwards? Maybe yes, I did. Yes, you did. You said retailers. I, I meant to say help the, help landlords. the landlords. Exactly. Oh, well, thank you for catching me. So on balance, do you think that has helped or hurt the landlords? And should we go back to the way it was before? I've been pretty vocal on this point ever since this passed. I, I think this is a terrible result for both retailers and landlords and has forced a whole series of things, not the least of which is a restructuring of a retailer but not fixing the retailer operationally. The things right. that you would have had time to address and do thoughtfully, you don't and then you count on being able to do after the company comes out of bankruptcy and then we see chapter 22s. Right. Right. Well, that says it pretty well. Holly, I thank you very much. Perhaps if we live long enough and if we're lucky, Congress will take a look at the ABI Commission report on Chapter 11 and uh, help foster reorganization, which almost no longer happens. Thank you very much and uh, look pleasure. forward to watching your panel when it happens. Thank you.